Hey guys, welcome back to Smart Simple Fit. Today, we're gonna to talk about the costs and benefits of doing unilateral workouts. All right, so if you're new here, this is gonna be a part of the Smart and Simple Lecture Series playlist. So if you haven't seen those videos before, there's a link in the description below and right here if you click. So go ahead and check that out. There's 12, not including this one, 13 including it, and they're basically 20 to 30 minute lectures that are gonna help you make your own exercise program. So I highly suggest you check those out, but without further ado, let's get into today's topic, which is doing the unilateral exercises. So we're going to cover the overall pros and cons of doing unilateral work. We're gonna talk about how it might serve an advanced or at least kind of a niche role within a good workout program. And then we're gonna look at eight specific examples of unilateral workouts and we're going to basically contrast it to uh, similar movements that would fall within the same exercise movement pattern, but bilateral. So for example, we'll talk about the split squat and compare it to a good old fashioned squat. We're only gonna look at those examples because they fall within the six basic movement patterns, plus a couple of isolation examples that I just think are helpful for you guys to think about. Okay, so for, as far as the pros and cons go, it's absolutely clear that doing you know, one side of your body, right? What does unilateral work mean? It means you're working the left half separate from the right half, right? Human beings have bilateral symmetry, which means that each side of our body is you know, a mirror image of the other, right? Typically. So when you're doing something like a one-arm push-up or a pistol squat from a calisthenic standpoint, those are really awesome exercises. They're very challenging. For someone who's even closer to the beginner side, maybe you've only been training a year or two, you're on the leaner side, maybe you don't have very much equipment or some combination of those things, those exercises are really awesome ways for you to challenge your body. Now, something like a one arm pull up or chin up is gonna take you probably a few years to work up towards, maybe two, three, four years. Uh, just depends on how dedicated you are to those vertical pull movements, bicep isolation, uh, your body fat percentage, things like that. But that one's going to take more or less years to get to, whereas some of the other ones, not so much. And of course, you can always use machines and dumbbells uh, to do unilateral work early on in a program. Why would you? Well, we'll talk about that later. But either way, it's clear that you can use unilateral work to get a very serious stimulus, especially with your own body weight, right? Half your body pushing your body through space is a lot harder than both sides of your body pushing your body through space. So either way, whether it's with equipment or with no equipment, it's clear that you can still get a very, very meaningful workout. In fact, sometimes a really hard workout uh, from unilateral exercise. Now, at the same time, whenever you work the left side of your body and not the right and, and vice versa, you have to switch sides. Every time you add a unilateral exercise, this lengthens how, how long your workouts are gonna take. So maybe you only have one unilateral exercise in a program for your legs, for your arms, that could be a meaningful way to, to have time management. Like if you just only do one or two upper body unilateral exercises throughout the week and then one or two lower body ones, that would probably prevent you from having a, a needlessly long, excessively long workout, right? Because these are going to take longer. That's definitely a con. But if you only have a few of them, that could be a way to still manage your time. So first pro, they definitely offer serious challenge. First con, they take longer. Beyond that, I think subjectively they feel pretty good, or at least they allow you to have a very focused connection with your muscle. Maybe that sounds kind of like a bro gimmick thing to say, like, oh, I can really focus on the contraction. But it's true. Anyone who's done a one-arm push-up or a pistol squat or isolation curls, whoever enjoys those, they can probably attest to the fact that it feels quite good. Even something goofier of like, an iliac pull down that we'll get to in the specific examples definitely allows you to have a very focused contraction. So when you're just separating left and right halves of the body, you can definitely get an awesome mind muscle connection, a nice peak contraction. You can really take your time with the tempo. And it's not that you can't do that two arms at a time, but perhaps from a systemic fatigue standpoint, each set is less fatiguing so you can sort of focus more but because you have to do more sets total that doesn't mean that the overall workout has less systemic fatigue what is systemic fatigue well basically that just means how overall tiring a uh, particular exercise is right without getting too galaxy brain beyond that they can require a bit of an annoying setup so something like a one-arm push-up maybe not uh, but if you're doing a, a one-arm bench press 
uh, or if you're doing Bulgarian split squats, the setup doesn't always feel great. I mean, Bulgarian split squats can be done with a lot of like chairs, benches, couches. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can do it in the squat rack for safety, have safety bars protecting you, uh, especially if you're doing like a barbell Bulgarian split squat, you know, Pete Ruiz style, <laughs> just, don't, just don't get snapped up like he did. That can, that can be a pretty practical way of doing it, but often the setup is a little bit more uh, monotonous. Uh, it takes a little bit more time to set up the exercise. Uh, or at least it's a bit inconvenient to do it and then switch sides and have that setup be a concern. Not a big deal, but I'd still call it a con. Next pro, I think there can definitely be a tangible rehab benefit, right? Like I've had clients that have, not from working with me, but outside of exercise related things, like one lady uh, tore her brachial radialis snowmobiling, right? So doing recreational activities tore muscle one side. So unilateral work allowed her to rehab the muscle that she tore. That took multiple months because it was a grade two tear, but without unilateral exercise, she wouldn't be able to address that concern. So if nothing else, I think from a rehab and probably even a warm up standpoint, when you have one side of your body that's more beat up than the other, unilateral exercise is a really great way to specifically focus and target that side of your body, whether that's to build a little bit of muscle, joint tolerance, tendon strength, flow some, get some blood flowing in there just for warm up sake, all of the above, it can be really, really good. So that is a huge benefit. Now that's not necessarily from like a strength and hypertrophy standpoint. That's again, recovery and warming up focused, but that's still a big benefit to include this type of thing in your workout, in your program. Now, I, I, the flip side of that coin is if you start going really heavy and have that strength and hypertrophy focus, doing it frequently, doing it often, doing it high volume, doing all your exercise unilateral, you might find that because it's less stable and therefore demands more stabilization from smaller muscle groups, and perhaps you could say there's a maybe a tangible risk of injury that's a little bit higher, like a Bulgarian split squat, right? Maybe more can go wrong there than a back squat, maybe not, maybe that's just you know, my imagination. I would personally feel a lot comfortable testing a heavy single on a, a squat than a Bulgarian split squat. That's just me personally. I'll leave that up to you to decide how you feel about that exercise. But I think it's fair to say where there's extra stabilization, where there's that one side targeting, you know, you can actually have a recovery or joint issue. So you don't want to be too hardcore in that sense. And maybe someone who's had meniscus or knee injuries, uh, they might find that lunges are tolerated worse than two-legged squat variations. And maybe you can work on that weak point, start with really light body weight stuff, small range of motion, work your way into it, but you don't want to just hammer and pound that stuff right off the bat. So recovery and joints can actually be an issue even though these same exercises perhaps have a specific uh, rehab benefit. It's just two flip sides of the same coin. Now, beyond that, I would say the last big picture benefit that I can think of as far as um, unilateral exercises go is the sport and muscle specificity. So if you have a sport where one side of your body needs to be uh, stronger to to perform your particular position or maybe it's a combat sport right you fight with one stance it's okay to have a dominant side that you kick more with or punch more with or throw you know you pitch your baseball with things like that i think that's okay and that's without becoming you know athlete x guru you know train like an athlete type of sport specificity right we've seen some of those gimmicks from him and and other content creators on the platform and on instagram uh, basically just making things up being like, oh, look how specific this exercise is to a sport. But either way, from a big picture standpoint, you may want to develop the musculature and the strength and the stability more, the coordination more on the side that you use more for a given sport. I think that's a valid approach. And at the same time, you can use unilateral exercises to sort of focus in a little bit on certain muscles. In my opinion, lunge variations, deep lunges, you know, deep Bulgarian split squats, do a really good job targeting the VMO, the inner quad. That doesn't mean you can't use deep squats or deep leg presses or leg extensions to also train that muscle group, but perhaps there's a tangible benefit from doing it one side versus the other. So from a specificity standpoint for muscles and maybe from a sport standpoint where you actually want to be stronger on one side than the other, that could be a very real benefit. Now, <laughs> keep in mind, especially newbies, guys, you're going to get duped by some gimmicks. 
I got duped by gimmicks when I was newer to exercise. You see a lot of flashy things on the internet, people uh, using trap bars, all kinds of crazy ways like Joel Seidman, resistance bands everywhere. It's just a free for all chaos, right? Okay, don't get duped by gimmicks. If it looks too good to be true, if it looks very flashy, it probably is too flashy, okay? If it looks simple but hard, that's the type of stuff you should be focusing on and making the meat and potatoes of an exercise program, right? Don't avoid things that are simple and hard you know, in favor of something that's like easy and complicated, that's a foolish mistake. Okay, now what would the advanced and, and more niche role of this be in my opinion? I think that if you really wanna maximize gains, having some unilateral work would just make you overall, uh, let's say you'd have less, less weak points, you know, well, if there's a tangible benefit for stabilization or, you know, Alec Ankiri talks about the one-arm bench and other unilateral exercises, having this, this benefit for the sort of potentiation in your muscle where by working one side, your nervous system fires harder to actually push the side you're working and maybe it's a more intense contraction than if you did both arms at the same time. Is that a gimmick? I don't know, I'll leave that up to you to decide. I think his presentation of it is more rational than other people have talked about unilateral exercises. Uh, but either way, I don't see that as a huge benefit, but if you're really looking to maximize your strength gains, hypertrophy gains, coordination, and so on, balance, uh, you know, injury prevention, maybe just bulletproofing yourself, right? That generic term that gets thrown around. Sure, if you want the absolute most out of a program, probably doing some you know, unilateral work is better than doing none. In addition, uh, you can have some weak sides, right? We'll develop weaknesses over time and small but meaningful weaknesses. And when you start to do you know, competitions, whether it's Olympic lifting, powerlifting, strongman, things like that, or, or fighting sports, your weak sides, your, your weaknesses, they come out. And so unilateral work may allow you to address your weaknesses a little bit better, uh, depending on the specific example. Okay, I don't wanna go into that one with too much detail. I just think that by attacking yourself, both sides at the same time and separately, may allow you to work on your weak links better than not doing that. That's up to you to decide for yourself though, what those weaknesses are. And last benefit, look, if you've been training for a while and things are getting stale, it's clearly the case that changing up your program, giving yourself new areas to set goals towards, to focus on, can really help you stay uh, motivated and even stay disciplined better if you have new things to work on, new areas to try and hit a PR, to get a plus one, one more rep than last time, 10 more pounds than last week and last month. You know, it's new areas for you to experiment and have fun and stay uh, willing to show up and push yourself without asking a whole lot of questions and doubting yourself. Okay, having something new to focus on, it can be really good without program hopping, but a change up in your routine, at the very least, probably means you'll be more well-rounded than someone who doesn't change up the program at all. Okay, now let's look at some specific examples. So the first six that we've got here fall within the basic six movement patterns, right? Vertical pull, vertical press, horizontal pull, horizontal press, squat movement pattern, and the hip hinge movement pattern. And then the last two is gonna be a tricep and bicep isolation. Those are just some common ones that I think you guys could uh, see in the gym. Maybe you have experience with these. You're wondering, is it better to do one side than the other? Uh, so these are common ones and then <laughs> some goofy ones that I really want to address too. So first off, let's start with the hip hinge movement pattern, looking at the one-legged Romanian deadlift. Now I see some very jacked dudes that swear by this exercise and I have successfully used this to help people with hip pain and muscular imbalances in the past. So I truly believe that it works, but I'm sort of lukewarm on it in general. Whereas, you know, if someone doesn't have an obvious left, right imbalance or like a, a hip related injury where they need to sort of maximize that stability, balance, coordination, strength development, they can probably just get away with doing two legged remaining deadlifts, right? Both legs at the same time means you're done and roughly half the time if all other things are equal, exertion, rep range, etc. Uh, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty lukewarm on this one. Here's my rating system, right? Yellow is going to be so-so in the middle. Red X, going to say pass. I'm not a big fan. And green check mark means I'm a big fan of this exercise and I think you should include it. So I'm going to say I'm so-so on this one. You know, that nice yellow filled in circle. Probably can't even see that on the video, but either way, this one works. I know from experience it works well. A lot of people swear by it. I'm just not too too excited to tell you guys, oh, you gotta try out wooden leg and remaining deadlifts. 
it's all right. It can work. Now let's talk about the split squat. So by split squat, I just mean lunge variations in general. That is technically the, it's, it's the same thing as saying the lunge. Split squat, you're literally just taking a squat and splitting it in half, right? <laughs> you're spreading out the work. Okay, you don't have to do walking lunges. You don't have to do forward lunges. You can do step back lunges, stationary lunges, Bulgarian split squats. You know, these are, these are all basically the same thing, right? With some, you know, directional change or the heels elevated. A Bulgarian is also called a heel elevated split squat or heel elevated lunge. It's, it's the same thing, right? Just slightly different nomenclature. But the point is, this exercise can definitely give you a nice deep stretch on the adductors, work the adductors a little bit harder, perhaps the VMO benefit, but it's easy to say, yeah, if you just do squats deeper, you'll get that same benefit. Or if you do leg press deeper, you'll get that same benefit. That is entirely possible. So because you can get a lot of the benefits from lunging and split squats, from just doing big range of motion, bilateral leg extension exercises, squat movement pattern exercise, I'm not in a hurry to recommend these either, even though I've seen people get good results from doing them and I've gotten results from them uh, in the past myself. So just like the one-legged RDLs, the split squat, which falls into the squat movement pattern, I'm going to say I'm pretty mixed on this one and we're going to fill that in with yellow because eh, it's so-so. I'm not in a hurry to recommend them, but at the same time, they're not terrible exercise by any means. Just keep in mind, uh, they're going to take a lot longer than a set of, set of squats. Oh, and uh, I might recommend not going quite as heavy. Don't be in a hurry to do sets of like three or five on lunches, okay? Maybe keep it from a, from a safety standpoint, maybe keep it more to like uh, six to 12 lunges per leg. That might be a bit more reasonable. That's my opinion, just some food for thought. Now on to the next exercise, one arm bench press. I mentioned Alec Ancuri earlier on in this video, and uh, he seems to be a big fan of this. I'm not. I think just from a balance standpoint, having a heavy weight there, unless you have something to hold on to, like the bench to really stay secure, I think it could be dangerous for people who are on the lighter side, depending on how heavy they're going. Uh, just getting set up on this exercise is not the most practical. Is it dangerous? No, not necessarily, but I can see a lot of things going wrong with it. And I think potential benefits there could be better off with, with a machine or a one-arm push-up if you really want to do a one-arm exercise. Uh, why didn't I choose one arm push up? I just felt like using this as an example. Um, this is maybe not the most common exercise on the internet right now, but it is one that's out there. And I'm going to give this a red X. I'm not a fan of this one. Again, dudes who are stronger than me, like Alec and Curry, they swear by it as being a good, maybe a more advanced or niche exercise, but I just don't see this being a valid use of your time. Chances are. But Feel free to prove me wrong and leave me a comment in the comment section. Tell me why you love that exercise. I don't. All right, now this is an exercise I do love, the bench over rows, the classic. You get on the bench, you get your knee on the bench, your arm on the bench, and you get a big old massive dumbbell, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 pounds, and you just rep that sucker out. And you can really focus on lengthening and protracting your scapula and getting your arm nice and straight and squeezing that fist, you know, clenching your hand up towards your chest, towards your rib cage, really squeezing, focusing on the mid traps and rhomboids, the lats, the traps. It's just such a good exercise. And if you don't have access to something like a vertical row machine or a seal row bench type setup, I think that this is a very practical way to do horizontal pulls like rowing variations um, in a way that spares your lower back. This doesn't really work your lower back hardly at all. Unlike Penlay rows, Rubus rows, barbell rows, those are good exercises, but not everybody's interested in getting you know, crazy lower back work. I don't think those are bad exercises. It's just that this is such a versatile exercise. And if there's any one exercise that I'm gonna put in someone's program that's unilateral, it's probably this one. I think it's an absolute winner. So we're gonna give that sucker a big old green check mark. That's a, that's a fan favorite for me. I love that one. Kettlebell press, right? You've seen it. You get the kettlebell by the handle and you push it up and, oh, it's shaky and instability. Oh, wow. You know, Pavel Sarsul and, oh, the Russian program. Oh, it's so fancy and special. I really consider this to be a gimmick exercise. I could see maybe if you've had like shoulder surgery or dislocation, rotator cuff injury, maybe there's an emphasis to really focus on both load right? Getting the right load and, and progressive overloading with instability so that your injured, your, your most delicate parts of that injured area get disproportionately worked. But I think that unless you're coming back from a one-sided shoulder injury, 
I don't see a kettlebell press being that good of an exercise. Getting it set up is a little bit awkward. It, there's, a, there's a skill component that isn't there with normal dumbbell pressing or barbell pressing or machine pressing. Okay, doing a machine press or dumbbell or barbell is probably just a lot more practical overall. And from a muscular development standpoint, the fact that those don't work your stabilizers as hard means you're gonna get more out of the weight. Do you get more out of less weight with this one? I don't know, you tell me. Having your stabilizers be the limiting factor is different than let's say a front squat where leverage, right, body position is the limiting factor. It's not stabilizing, okay? It's the leverages on a front squat versus back squat. So sometimes you don't get more out of less weight, you just get less with less weight and maybe a little bit higher risk of injury. I'm not saying it's a dangerous exercise, I'm just really not a fan of it. So I'm gonna give that a big red X. I don't think it's dangerous. I think you should try this exercise and see if you like it. Uh, again, if you like it, feel free to include it. I just have no interest in uh, doing it in a program and I've never had a client where I think to myself, boy, they benefit from that. Nah, not necessarily. Okay, and iliac pull downs. This one's such a meme at this point. Bald Omni Man has fun making fun of this exercise and probably some other people too. I definitely know some people personally who are personal trainers some, some semi-personally who recommend this for, you know, oh, you get such a great mind muscle connection. And just like we we're talking about the focus, that's true, right? You do get a really good pump and, and stimulus in your iliac pull down, but it's such a slow rep, large range of motion. It, it's really exaggerated when people do it. They could probably go a little heavier, a little faster, and it would work just fine. But I see this as such a nerd exercise where you could just do chest to bar lat pull downs or chest to bar pull ups or weighted pull ups or normal lat pull downs and you'll be just fine with enough hard work and time your lats will grow you can isolate your lats by doing straight arm pull downs in addition to those basic exercises and they're going to grow just fine guys even rows you know if done heavy enough often enough are definitely going to grow your lats even though i generally consider vertical pulls better for the lats than horizontal pulls so I'm going to go ahead and give this one a red X. Again, it's not dangerous. It's not ineffective. It's just goofy. It's just such a nerd exercise, right? All focused on optimal biomechanics, right? Fancy, fancy jargon designed to lure you in and make you think it's like super intellectual. But in reality, you're probably just, uh, how would you say, coping for the fact that you're not very strong at lat pulldowns and pull-ups and you should just focus on the basics. That's the truth. Okay, last two. I'm a big fan of both of these exercises. The French press, doing this, uh, you know, either unilateral or bilateral, very good, very good exercise. I think that the, the unilateral version where your arms up behind your head like this gives you more room to get that nice stretch. And so you'll probably feel more work in the long head of your triceps doing your French press, or I guess you'd call it French curl or overhead extension, either way, where the arms behind your back one, one arm at a time definitely gives you a nicer stretch, nicer connection in the long head, but it's, it's slower and it's unilateral. So chances are you can just get away with doing it natural hypertrophy style with one big dumbbell, or my favorite way of doing this exercise is actually both arms at the same time with dumbbells. Why is it better with two? Well, two lighter dumbbells is easier to get behind your head than one big one you have to get up on your shoulder. And then it's a little bit awkward to dump the weight afterwards. So is it good? Yes, overall, both of these are great exercises, bilateral or unilateral. But if you're gonna do it one arm at a time, I would say have more of a, a rehab focus or a warm up focus right before a heavy day of pressing. This is gonna get a lot of blood flowing directly into your elbow joint, elbow tendon. And I can say this exercise personally, almost single-handedly cured my elbow tendonitis symptoms that I had uh, throughout this year and last year after a, a program where I just went way too hardcore with bench press and overhead press, and I gave myself tendonitis. Guys, this type of movement done slowly, deep, with uh, slow eccentric, high repetitions is really great for curing elbow tendonitis. So I can't, I can't crap on this exercise, it's fantastic. From a hypertrophy standpoint, it's really good, but I still lean towards it being better, both arms at the same time. Either way, this one gets a big check mark. And the last one is one arm curl variations. So yeah, I know I, I kind of broke my rules. I said specific examples and then kind of got generic, but either way, whether you're doing one arm alternating curls standing or you're sitting down doing some isolation curls, you know, people swear by this stuff and some people hate this stuff. But I think that if you've had a good experience with isolation curls, that's a good reason to do it. I just personally don't enjoy it. I don't think the range of motion is enough. 
or the strength curve feels right for me to get a good uh, pump out of it. I, hard time finding a weight that feels like a sweet spot as far as doing it for reps. I just don't enjoy that exercise very much, the isolation curl, but some people swear by it. So if you like that exercise, keep doing it. Don't let me talk you out of it. And then standing alternating curls, I think are really good, especially if you're, you know, from a progressive overload standpoint, if you have, you know, you're, you're about to do 40 pound curls or 45, 50 pound curls for the first time, chances are you'll feel a little bit stronger, right? Being able to sort of lean and counterbalance a little bit, manipulate the leverages, get that nervous system going, one-sided activation, you know, enhanced potentiation, whatever that's called, who cares? <laughs> but you're gonna feel a little bit stronger doing it one arm at a time than two arms at a time, especially like a strict curl right down to your thighs and back up. So you, it'll allow you to slightly cheat for the sake of getting the weight up, for setting PRs or, you know, your first few times using the movement for several times, it's going to be a little bit easier because, you know, those five pound jumps on biceps curls, 30 to 35 to 40 to 45, those are massive. Those take months to level up your biceps gains. You guys know if you've been training your biceps for years, it takes a long time to get to the next weight level. So one arm alternating curls are fantastic. And overall, I don't think that one arm curls are a waste of time at all. I think they're very good, but you know, limit yourself maybe to one unilateral variation and then have a bilateral variation, something like an easy curl bar, preacher curl, dumbbell strip curl, all the basic normal stuff, right? Even a pelican curl. Um, <laughs> just don't get carried away doing like four or five biceps curl variations. Some people learn to that, not me. But I'm gonna give this one a big old green check mark. And that really concludes today's video, guys. Again, this is just my opinion. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, if you wanna try all these exercises and you enjoy them all, Far be it for me to say that you can't do these exercises. Don't take my expert opinion. Try it for yourself and see what works, guys. So overall, there's plenty of pros and cons to unilateral exercise. I think you know what you need to do. Generally speaking, focus on the basics. You got two limbs, you might as well train them two, two arms and two legs at a time. But that being said, yes, there's room to include this type of exercise. Just don't focus on it more than you focus on the basics. And that's it. So thanks, guys. I hope you enjoyed this one. Again, it'll be in the Smart and Simple Lecture Series playlist. So I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. And until then, take care.